Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, your fast paced video blog that's designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. And today I've got a special guest who's an entrepreneur and also a teacher of entrepreneurs, Mr. Paul Neal. Welcome, Paul. Welcome to the show. Hey, Wayne. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about being here today. Good. Thanks for being on. And uh, just a little background on Paul. He's the owner of Vantage Point Commercial Capital. He's a trailblazer in empowering business owners like you, the listener, to create wealth, autonomy, and control by owning your own commercial space. So he's not just an expert in real estate and commercial real estate. He's going to help make a very complex topic accessible and engaging. And he did so in his new book, Unleash Your Business, Unlock Wealth, Autonomy, and Control, by buying your building and firing your landlord. And it delves into this whole transformative approach to commercial property ownership. So this is a great topic for all of our uh, listeners and particularly my clients. Tell me a little bit first, Paul, how you got into the whole commercial real estate business, what you've been doing for the last part of your career before you started <laughs> Vantage Point. Yeah, yeah. So I got into real estate finance in 1998. And ironically enough, I, I uh, my background was not finance, it was engineering and um, came out of school, actually had a, a started a business when I was in school. And I've had like six businesses in my career. And wow. about four of them are related to real estate. Yeah, I had uh, had some really good successes. I had one major blow up with the, the the financial crisis of 08, but then turned around and sold another one a few years later, did pretty well. So, um, so I've, I've seen a lot, experienced a lot, but um, specifically in real estate and real estate finance. So through my, my experience of working with business owners and entrepreneurs and being one myself and sort of knowing how they, they operate, um, that's, that's sort of my tribe. And I sort of noticed over a period of time, so, sort of two grand, uh, camps, Wayne, those businesses that, um, it, that, that were successful over the long run and they were just heads down, focused on growing their business and scaling and doing whatnot. But sort of, um, you know, living in rented space, you know, lease to lease to lease over time. Right. And then and then the other group that kind of the same track, but somewhere along the way, they made the decision that they were going to buy uh, a piece of commercial real estate uh, where they could, you know, home up their business, where they could they could run the business that they're running anyway from their own territory, their own land versus someone else's. And the, the disparity over the long run in terms of the opportunity and the wealth accumulation for that group, um, it, it tended to be, um, they tended to be in a much stronger s situation downstream. And so I got fascinated with that. And, and I, as, I, as I did more and more in that space, I also realized that there's a lot of ignorance out there, um, you know, and, and rightfully so, because there's really not one source you can go to, you know, commercial lending is more like the Wild West versus residential lending, you know, and again, most business people and entrepreneurs are heads down, you know, they're working their business or they're, they're, you know, meeting payroll, how can we grow and expand and hire employees and put systems in and all that. And so, you know, the last thing they generally think about is, you know, the space until the lease comes up for renewal or they're, you know, busting at the seams or whatever, there's some trigger moment. But, you know, a lot of times it's too late at that point to, to engage in, you know, an acquisition. And so they just kind of sign again and move on. And so, yeah, I've, I've been there myself. I mean, I, I have my own business businesses and I'm currently leasing the space that I'm in, although I love the space. If he would sell it to me, I would buy it, but it would be too expensive. Um, but the idea of owning versus renting is a really important concept. So tell us a little bit about the the benefits of owning versus renting and why it makes sense for a lot of entrepreneurs to consider this. Yeah. It, you know, um, I, I'm going to do an analogy and, and kind of uh, start with the idea of, you know, with the question of why do you own the house that you live in? Um, you know, it's a similar kind of an idea. You know, um, you generally, when you get started in your career, you're probably not going to, you know, go buy a house that the first, you know, the first step you make right out of school or into trade school or whatever, you're going to, you're going to rent an apartment or lease a space and for two, three, four years to kind of get your career on track, get your revenue coming in, kind of get your sea legs and all that. But at right. some point in the, in the process, you're, you're going to make this decision that, Hey, I want to buy 
uh, buy a house to live in. And, and there are a lot of reasons you do it, right? You know, you can talk about the qualitative reasons. Um, you want to make your spouse or potential spouse happy if you're going to be married because they want to have a home of their own, right? In my case, my wife wanted to plant flowers and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, me but, too. <laughs> right. But, but beyond that, you, you, you know, you own your own home typically because it's a, an opportunity for you to sort of get on the equity appreciation train in America. You know, inflation is one of those things that is never going to go away. Um, in fact, the government likes inflation, a certain amount of inflation, not a lot of inflation. And so real estate generally in the long run will appreciate in value. Um, no one knows the short run, the one, two, three year cycles of real estate. But generally, if you're in an area, unless it's going south, you know, in a major way, um, it's going to be worth more in the future. So you kind of struggle to get into that first house. Um, you're making payments. You've got to live somewhere. So instead of paying the, the, the tenant or the landlord, you're paying yourself. Every little payment, a little bit of it goes into equity. Your property should appreciate. There's some tax advantages there. And so it puts you in a position that downstream three, four, five years later, now you've got this asset just by living um, that you can do something with. And so, um, and, and as, as we know, statistically, the, the bulk of Americans' wealth as they get older is in the value of their, their home. And so if they don't have this home to invest in over time, then what is their, you know, what does their wealth situation look like after 30, 40 years of working? And so with a business, the, the concept is the same thing. You, you wouldn't go out and try to buy uh, your commercial building in the first few years of business. I mean, you're trying to figure things out. You're getting your customers. You're learning your systems, hiring employees, maybe maybe upgrading employees and staff and all that to get to the point where now you've got uh, your sea legs. You've got consistent profitability. You're growing and you have runway ahead of you that you, you feel like you're going to be in this for a while. It's not, you know, I'm going to pop out in two years and go on to do something else. And so the idea is, okay, now you're stable, you're growing, you, you, you've got to house your business somewhere. And I'm going to asterisk by that, Wayne. I'm specifically talking to businesses that have a need for a local presence, right? Right. So whether you have employees or customers or patients or clients coming to a local location. Serv service oriented type clients. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 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 Not, not a sort of a virtual only business where your employees are distributed. It's maybe you're, you know, you're doing something online or whatever completely not for you, but for those locally based businesses that have that, that runway ahead and, um, it, and, and okay, now you're in a position to do it. And so you should consider it for a lot of the same reasons that you considered buying and you bought your own personal house, the equity okay. appreciation. Et cetera, so, et cetera, et cetera. so I'm going to play devil's advocate with you for a yeah. minute. Um, and and the, the one thing that we advise clients on, by the way, is if you're going to buy commercial real estate and you're going to lease it to your business, which is meaning that you're going to own it in a separate entity. Correct. Um, please. And I'm sure you 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 follow this this formula, Paul. Do not put the real estate into a corporation, whether it's a C corp or an S corp, because of the tax consequences that could hit you down the road unexpectedly. And uh, so, you know, there's there's a strong reason to put it into an LLC and not elect S corp status. It could be a partnership or a disregarded entity, depending on how it's structured. Um, but for tax reasons, we don't. We never recommend putting it into a corporation. We've had to unwind stuff in the past <laughs> that uh, was was done like that, and it, it creates a big mess. Um, devil's advocate, uh, commercial real estate today. Would you still be hawking, you know, commercial real estate to a a business that's going to lease its own space or at least part of uh, the space that it might be purchasing? Is the market still there? Um, are prices aligned with the risks associated with commercial real estate. And the third sort of corollary is, are interest rates too high to afford it? So how, yeah. how do you finance it? And does it make sense to invest in commercial real estate today? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, you know, commercial real estate like residential is going to be based upon location, right? Every, every area is different. Every market is different. And so in some markets, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. In other markets, it does make sense. Um, interest rates certainly play into the equation because the higher they are, the more expensive it is. Yes. And so there are some, some factors you have to weigh. And in your specific situation, 
you know, your entry point into it, you know, it might not make sense today. It might make sense a year from now, two years from now or whatnot, based upon some of those factors. Um, so, you know, we think that, and there, there's no guarantee, we have no crystal ball that we're sort of at the peak of the, the interest rate curve and we're getting to, to, to hit the other side where we'll hopefully moderate a bit over time. The thing about commercial real estate is, you know, there's many different classes and types of commercial real estate. And we hear about, you know, the flight to work from home and the, you know, everyone, particularly post COVID, you know, no one wants to go back into the office and whatnot. And, you know, these large class A office buildings that, you know, are 50% occupied and, you know, what's the value of those? Again, when I'm speaking real estate for the, the small business person, the small entrepreneur that's got a locally based business, I'm not talking about that kind of real estate. I'm talking about real estate where um, it's in the local community. It's a it's a standalone building where your where your CPA practice or maybe your veterinarian building is going to be, or a flex warehouse space where you know your your HVAC company is going to have offices in the front. You're going to have flex warehouse space in the back. Um, it's it's these types of spaces that are in high demand in any of the growth areas that you go to today. Um, and, and again, I would asterisk again, if you, you, if you live in an area where the population is going down and people are fleeing the area for some reason, and there's a multitude of reasons to flee a lot of areas, quite frankly, then you're, you probably don't want to buy, you know, commercial real estate there. Um, in fact, you might want to consider relocating your business somewhere else, but <laughs> that's a whole other conversation, right? That's right. But if you've got an inflow of people that, you know, the outlook is good in the long run, then the question you have to ask is, okay, how much am I paying for a lease? What's the opportunity cost of not buying? Because there is an opportunity cost. And the thing is, again, over the long run, mo most real estate is going to appreciate in value. And so even if you come in at a higher interest rate today, as rates improve, you do have an opportunity to refinance that sometime in the future. Yeah, so that's true. That's true. You're not locked into today's rate necessarily. So let's say let's say I found a piece of real estate. I don't know if it's a standalone building or it's part of a you know a condo complex or something like that. Um, which I had a question on for you because it seems like you're gravitating towards standalone buildings versus you know condo structures or something like that. But uh, we'll get to that in a second. The question is how long should an owner anticipate holding on to that property to make it worth their while? So there's some point. When the appreciation, you know, expected appreciation, it may go up, it may go down, you know, but over time it's supposed to go up. And, you know, paying on the mortgage, if we're, you know, at a seven and a half percent mortgage today or eight percent mortgage on commercial real estate or higher, mm. um, you know, that's expensive. And so how long should the owner really contemplate holding on to this property, which will indicate how long the owner needs to stay in the business or they're going to transition to somebody else and continuing the ability to lease it. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I always say the general rule of thumb is if you don't plan on being in a, in a space for three years or more, then it's probably not a good idea. And that number is it, it's fungible. It will move forward or backwards based upon acquisition price, um, you know, down payment, because you talk about, you know, depending on how much money you're putting in, to get into the building, then again, you have opportunity costs there where you can reinvest yeah. that money somewhere else and so forth. Um, and so, you know, we have programs, we have people that will get in with 0% down in an owner user space. Um, most typically it's five to 10% down, but it's not the, the typical 20 to 25% that you will generally think of when you go talk to your local bank. Okay. And, and that can make a owner, big difference. Because it's owner occupied, right? Be, because it's owner occupied. Right. That's right. You're moving your, your profitable business in there. You're going to be the primary tenant. And the other uh, consideration would be um, your strategy. So if I'm taking 100% of the space, then I'm my business is responsible for carrying the freight. But if I'm taking, let's say, 51 or 60% of the space and I'm going to lease out the, the remaining part, then that's going to significantly defray my my mortgage payment. And so my ROI um, moves a lot closer to, you know, the start point here and gives me a lot of, a lot of opportunity. We just literally just closed two, three weeks ago on a 12,000 square foot steel building warehouse down at the beach in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And this is a high end remodeler moving his enterprise and he's taken 8,000 feet of the space. Wow. And yeah, and he's got 4,000 feet that, He's already got tenants that have signed leases 
that will occupy when the building is finished. And based on the market rents of that type of space, they're, they're getting what, 2,000 feet each, which is in really high demand. Um, that almost makes the entire mortgage payment on the building. So he's gone from an old space in a not great area to a brand new building in a nice area. And, um, you know, I think his interest rates right around 7%. So they're not as crazy as, you know, we hear about today. And, mm -hmm. and again, he'll be able to refinance that in the future, but, but the tenants are paying the freight. So there's ways to mitigate, you know, that ROI and how long you keep it. And, you know, the other thing is, it might be three years from now your business is busting at the seams again and you want to move to another building again. Well, then, you know, put a tenant in the building you've got, you know, and then go buy another one. You know, or just have multiple locations. I, I've, I've got clients who've done that over the years where they grew, they grew so fast that they needed another location to do what they're doing, depending on what they're doing, obviously. Yeah, um, particularly in, a, in, 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 in more major metro areas, lots of population. It makes more sense because people aren't going to drive, you know, but so far to get somewhere. And, um, and yeah, and as an owner of space, the coolest thing about it, we have a dentist that did that. Every two to three years, he would open a new location in, in and around the area. And mm -hmm. every time it was very low down payment because it was owner, user. He would hire a fresh young dentist out of school, put him in there. He already had the systems in place and the, and the advertising and all that, just expanded the practice. Now he's got five locations. He's got a major operational enterprise with his, bit, his, his dental practices. But but then he's got this real estate empire that's just growing over time. That that uh, has just been uh, a really cool strategy to see him. Roll yeah, out. I've I've done that. We've got a couple of uh, oral surgeons who are doing that right now, and then we've also got uh, I've got a restaurateur in Baltimore that uh, that's how he has grown his business. He goes and acquires the location for the restaurant. Fortunately, he's a very successful restaurateur because not all of them are. Yeah. Um, but he's he's been very successful, and so he's he buys the building in which the restaurant's located, and then leases it to uh, the uh, restaurant company, if you will. So I think it works out really well. Um, so the time frame you mentioned was you know at least three years, and that's you know when you enter into a lease today, a commercial lease, it's at least three years too. Um, the the landlords. Are, it's interesting. I, I talked to a lot of real estate brokers and the landlords seem to be uh, not lowering rents in any way, shape or form they, because that will hurt them in the long run. But they are giving a lot of concessions for people to move into spaces. So when you're you're doing your economic analysis, it's not just a monthly rental payment. It's what are the uh, concessions that the landlord's willing to give you in terms of uh, uh, build out in terms of free rent. And then you got to compare it to the out of pocket costs of operating the property yourself and, uh, and owning it. And, uh, you didn't mention it, but, uh, tell us about depreciation in commercial real estate and how that can help the buyer of the property, uh, generate some additional benefit. Yeah, well, um, you know, I'm maybe treading in your territory a little bit here as a CPA, okay. you know and, I, and, I'm, and I and we always say you need to consult your CPA. Every, everyone's situation is different, but generally, what we see there's a couple of areas in the ta in the tax world that's beneficial. Depreciation is one where you know you set up that LLC, real estate holding company, and then you have your your operating company that basically signs a lease to your real estate company. And you build in market increases in rent, rent escalations. It's got to be market, but you can charge, you know, legitimate increases. And so as your as your rent increases on your operating company, that's a deductible expense from your operating income. Right. And then right. now you have revenue coming into your building, but you're depreciating the building itself. And so you're offsetting some of that um, some of that revenue. And so you're seeing some tax advantages there. We see the 1031 exchange opportunity with a lot of these buildings. Um, yes, I have. I have. Explain. Uh, explain what that is for the yeah. listeners. Basically, it's a it's 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 in the tax code. It essentially says that um, if you have a, a a gain in the the value of of real estate, it can be residential or commercial. Um, there's a there's a piece of the code if it's um, that, that says you can take that gain if you reinvest the gain into. Um, other property that's uh, you can get the details, but basically like kind, like kind or, kind or more expensive or whatever, then you can defer the taxes on that gain. And so you don't get out of paying taxes. Tax basis so that when they go to sell it, 
There's no capital gains tax. There's no ordinary income tax. There's nothing on it. Um, and that's pretty cool. So I like they that as a strategy. Well, and they could have inherited a, you know, a building or a portfolio of buildings worth millions and millions of dollars that's paid off. I, so an example of a, another friend, a client, Kathy, she's an OBGYN and mm -hmm. she's, she sold her practice. Well, about 15 years ago, she bought her building. And um, about three years ago, she sold her practice to a larger medical group, you know, sort of buying up smaller ones. And so they gave her a nice buyout and then she negotiated working there continually as a physician for the next three or four years because she wasn't quite ready to retire. And oh, by the way, um, they're going to they're going to rent and they are renting the building that she owns now free and clear, paying her a nice a, a nice five figure revenue stream every single month that she can do that as long as she wants. Or if she wants, she could sell it or could, she could do this past this building that's now worth, I don't know how many million dollars to her two kids, you know, um, downstream and they've got an amazing, you know, nest egg to, to start their life. So there's a lot of advantages. One of the other ones, too, that a lot of people don't think about is as you as the equity appreciation grows in the property from pay down on the loan and the, the the value you can borrow money out of that commercial building and you're not paying taxes on it because it's dead right. now not and not a capital gain that's and a so, very good point you can borrow against the equity in your own property yeah and you're not using a bank you're yeah. borrowing it from yourself or from the yeah. entity that that owns it which yeah. is magnificent you know it's a magnificent <laughs> way of of accruing, transferring wealth uh, as well. And so yeah. uh, we've done that before. Um, in the few minutes we have left, um, I had one question that deals with commercial real estate, and I'm not sure if, you, if you're comfortable answering it, but th this was my question. If I had the choice, you know, in, in Northern Virginia, everything's expensive. The, the, the cost of real estate has just skyrocketed, particularly along the Dulles Toll Road, where there's all this massive development going on. And so let's say I'm a dentist or a lawyer or a CPA and I'm, I'm looking for, you know, the right property. Um, there are very few standalone properties that you're going to see around here. And if you do see them, they're in very unusual places that may or may not be conducive to attracting clients and customers. Um, so the option is buy something like that, that may be sort of off the beaten path or buy a condo in a bigger building that, you know, was converted, say, from a leased building to condos, what would your advice be to the client? You know, what are the risks of going into a condo building? And, well, uh, things yeah. You have to deal with? yeah, I mean, I'll answer it. I mean, obviously, every situation is different. And, it, and, and I'm, I'm tracking you because in, in the areas like Northern Virginia, that, that is, it is more difficult with, uh, with land and, and development. We have people buy condos on a regular basis, but I, I always, you know, caution them and footnote the, the, this whole idea that, you know, when you buy a condo, you're signing up for this, this whole association, right? You're signing up for, um, you don't have total control at the end of the day. You know, there are things that can come down from the association of assessments and things like that. Right. Um, and so you just have to be a little more leery about that. You know, that might not be a 30 year hold. That might be a 10 year play, you know, and that you use it as a stepping stone or, or whatnot to, to get to the next level. So I, I would definitely look a little deeper and a little harder at that before you pull the trigger. Good, good advice. Good advice. So we're talking today with Paul Neal, who uh, is a an entrepreneur. He's a financial strategist and he's an author who wrote Unleash, Unleash, not Unleash, Unleash Your Business. And Paul, if people want to get a copy of the book, how do they find it? Yeah, um, absolutely. If they go to my website, ownyourbuildingnow.com, that's ownyourbuildingnow.com, um, they can get a free copy. You pay shipping like six, seven bucks. We print it and mail it to you and uh, can have it to I you. I just signed up. I just, I just oh, ordered you? mine. Yeah. Oh, sweet. And you know, the whole thing about it, Wayne, is that my, the idea is business owners, entrepreneurs are super busy. We, we don't really like to read because we're moving so fast, right? And so I wrote it so you could sit down on a Saturday morning with a cup of coffee in about an hour and a half to two hours and, and, and get a really high level overview of the whole process, you know, the benefits, the, the, the risks, the process, what's involved and all that. So you can walk away at the end and say, okay, I've got a pretty good idea of how, you know, what's involved in this now and at least uh, uh, be pretty educated in the process. Do you provide a source of capital? 
Uh, does your business provide a source of capital for potential buyers? So generally we don't. Um, most of what we do is the front end sort of preparation. So okay. we're, we're more of a consulting. So we do four things. We, we, we investigate, we underwrite, we evaluate. And then if you want, we can help facilitate the transaction. We have funding sources nationally that we work with uh, really good. But, you know, I found in my experience that, um, again, business owners are busy. There's a lot of ignorance in the market. There's a lot you don't know. And right. we don't know what we don't know. And so our job is to you know, minimize your time involvement, but glean as much information as we can in an efficient way to then be able to come back, uncover the issues, maybe you know, uh, uplift the skeletons out of the closet so we can address all these things and understand but more importantly than that, understand what are those goals, short term, long term, what are you trying to accomplish to see what makes sense? And then at that point, advise and say, OK, Wayne, based upon what you're telling me, your business financials, these issues, you know, here's what we suggest. And here's three or four options in the market, the pros, the cons, the pluses and minuses like, you know, this one has covenants. This one requires you to pledge your house. This one doesn't require that, you know, so you at least understand going in and then you can make an intelligent choice to say, all right. If I want to move forward, now I know, you know what it's going to take to do it and you're prepared and then we'd be happy to then assist because most of the folks we work with at that point want us to facilitate you know, and get the deal done. So how do they get in touch with you to find out about your consulting services? Same thing. If you go to ownyourbuildingnow.com, oh, okay. there's a button. You can schedule a, a little 20-minute cool. uh, strategy session. We'll have a call and uh, either myself or one of my team and just to kind of you know check the boxes and see if it's potentially an option for you or not. Good. We've been talking with Paul Neal. Paul, thank you so much for being a special guest on Blueprint for Wealth today. Yeah, Wayne, this is great. I appreciate it. Those are great questions and great dialogue. Good. And uh, I'll look forward to talking to you again about buying my office building soon. So at least sending some clients down your way. Um, again, thank you listeners for listening to Blueprint for Wealth. Tune in next time for another special topic and a special entrepreneur guest. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.